This is the 17th Radcliffe Brown Lecture on Social Anthropology. The series was set up in 1972 by the British Academy and the Association of Social Anthropologists, and in fact named after the Association's first president, A.R. Radcliffe Brown, who was in fact the first uh, professor of social anthropology in the University of Oxford. Uh, the 17th, it began with Raymond Firth, who presented the first Radcliffe Brown lecture, and two years ago it was Philippe de Scholar, with very many eminent names in between, and I won't go through them. We now have Professor Tim Ingold from the University of Aberdeen, who is, in many ways, in my view, and I'm sure he's been shared by others, one of the pioneering minds in the whole field of anthropology. Indeed, calling the lecture just social anthropology almost uh, negates some of what he would say. He's an anthropologist. He conducted fieldwork among the Sami and Finnish peoples of North and Northeastern Finland, mainly in the 1970s and early 1980s, among uh, peoples who herded reindeers and hunted them. Indeed, that relationship between herding and hunting, ranching, became a principal focus. He thus began with what we would nowadays, I suppose, call ecology, but it was always ecology with a distinctive approach. He didn't, as it were, just see humans imposing themselves on the environment. He rather asked what was the relationship between humans and animals, and in my view, I think, was probably the first to take this seriously. I'm reminded of a conference in Southampton, 1986, I think it was, which I attended, in which this novel relationship was talked about. And it went further, do humans manage animals or do animals manage humans and so on. And it's led him into questioning all sorts of boundaries, not just that between, you say, humanity and animality, but also between culture and nature itself. From nature into questions of evolution, from different disciplinary perspectives, not just anthropological, but biological, historical, and psychological and cognitive. And over the last decade or so, he has promoted the idea of what he calls relationality, which he may refer to in his lecture, but it's basically the idea that forms of life not only have relationships with each other, but it's an ongoing relationality in which life forms, as it were, move, uh, not as just as uh, agents determined by structures, but in ways in which they should we say, leave trails of themselves. Now, this has led to, in my view, a very radical rethinking of anthropology itself, not just, as it were, within its own terms, but in relationship to other disciplines. As to Tim's career, in 1990, he became the chairholder of the social anthropology at Manchester University. In 1995, he assumed the chair of social anthropology, the Max Kluckman Chair of Social Anthropology, which I think was then newly created, and then in 1999 moved to the new chair, newly created chair, and newly created department of anthropology at Aberdeen. And all the while, throughout this period at Manchester and Aberdeen, he's engaged not only in, should we say, cutting edge scholarly work, he's also been concerned with, I suppose, what I can only call outreach activities. He edited the remarkable Encyclopedia of Anthropology. He also set up the Group for Debates in Anthropological Theory, which also eventuated in publications, important ones. He's currently working on the relationship between, as he puts it, movement, knowledge, description, and I'm sure some of this will come out, all of which is brought together in the phenomenon of what he calls the line, and I hope we hear something about that too. He's also working on another book, which he calls provisionally at least the four A's, Anthropology, Archaeology, Art and Architecture, and I'm sure that we'll also have some insights into that as well. What he calls, if you like, a mutually enhancing set of ways of engaging with our surroundings. So let me present Professor Tim Ingold with his lecture entitled Anthropology is Not Ethnography. <laughs> Thank you very much, David, and um, thank you all for, for coming. The objective of anthropology, I believe, is to seek a generous, comparative, but nevertheless critical understanding of human being and knowing in the one world we all inhabit. The objective of ethnography 
is to describe the lives of people other than ourselves with an accuracy and a sensitivity honed by detailed observation and prolonged first-hand experience. My thesis is that anthropology and ethnography are endeavours of quite different kinds. This isn't to claim that one is more important than the other or more honourable, nor is it to deny that they depend on one another in significant ways. It's simply to assert that they are not the same. And indeed, this might seem like a statement of the obvious, and so it would be, were it not for the fact that it has become commonplace for writers in our subject to treat the two as virtually equivalent, exchanging anthropology for ethnography or the anthropologist for the ethnographer more or less on a whim, or even exploiting their supposed synonymy as a stylistic device to avoid verbal repetition. Many colleagues, to whom I've informally put the question, have told me that in their view, there is little, if anything, to distinguish anthropological from ethnographic work. Most are convinced that ethnography lies at the core of what anthropology is all about. And for them to suggest otherwise seems almost anachronistic. It's like going back to the bad old days, the days, some might say, of Radcliffe Brown. For it was he who, in laying the foundations for what was then the new science of social anthropology, insisted on the absolute distinction between ethnography and anthropology. And he did so in terms of a contrast which was much debated then, but little heard of today, between ideographic and nomothetic inquiry. An ideographic inquiry, Radcliffe Brown explained, aims to document the particular facts of past and present lives, whereas the aim of nomothetic inquiry is to arrive at general propositions or theoretical statements. So ethnography is specifically a mode of ideographic inquiry differing from history and, history and archaeology in that it's based on direct observation of living people rather than on written records or material remains attesting to the activities of people in the past. Anthropology, to the contrary, is a field of nomothetic science. As Radcliffe Brown declared in his introduction to structure and function in primitive society in a famous sentence that as an undergraduate beginning my anthropological studies at Cambridge in the late 1960s, I had to learn by heart. Comparative sociology, of which social anthropology is a branch, is a theoretical or nomothetic study of which the aim is to produce acceptable generalizations. Now this distinction between anthropology and ethnography was one that brooked no compromise and Radcliffe Brown reasserted it over and over again. Returning to the theme in his Huxley Memorial Lecture for 1951 on the comparative method in social anthropology, which is best known for its revision of the theory of totemism, Radcliffe Brown insisted that, quote, without systematic comparative studies, anthropology will become only historiography and ethnography. And the aim of comparison, he maintained, is to pass from the particular to the general, from the general to the more general, and ultimately to the universal. Now this distinction between the ideographic and the nomothetic was first coined in 1894 by the German philosopher historian Wilhelm Windelband, who was a leading figure in the school of thought then known as Neo-Kantianism. And Windelband's real purpose was to lay down a clear dividing line between the craft of the historian, whose concern is with judgments of value, and the project of natural science, concerned as it is with the, accumulative, with the accumulation of positive knowledge based on empirical observation. But Vintelband did so by identifying history with the documentation of particular events, and science with the search for general laws. And this left his distinction wide open for appropriation by positivist natural science to denote not its opposition to history, but the two successive stages of its own programme, first, the systematic collection of empirical facts, and secondly, the organisation of these facts within an overarching framework of general principles. It was left to Heinrich Rickert, who was a pupil of Windelband and a co-founder with him of the Neo-Kantian school, to sort out the confusion by pointing out that there are distinct ways, respectively scientific and historical, of attending to the particular. One way treats every entity or event as an objective fact, the other attributes to it some meaning or value. So a geologist setting out to reconstruct the history of a rock formation, or a paleontologist seeking to reconstruct a phylogenetic sequence on the basis of fossil evidence, 